But the big difference there is that the system that writes the data that produces it is producing what I would call a general purpose event and then leaves it up to the consumers to do whatever they will with it. And that's a big change uh, in terms of boundaries and in terms of responsibilities uh, that wasn't really available to us based on the technologies we had of say 20 years ago. From Toro Cloud, this is the Coding Over Cocktails podcast, a free pool of thoughts and ideas from IT experts, thought leaders, and authors sharing their insights and advice for individuals architecting solutions for the ever-changing landscape of enterprise tech, digital transformation, and more. Welcome to episode 68 of the Coding Over Cocktails podcast. My name is Kevin Montalvo, and joining me is Toro Cloud CEO and founder, David Brown. Good day, David. Good day, Kevin. All right. Our guest for today is a staff technologist at the office of the CDO in Confluent. He has held positions in embedded software development and quality assurance. His expertise includes DevOps, technical leadership, software development, and data engineering. He's the author of the book, Building Event-Driven Microservices, Leveraging Organizational Data at Scale, which we'll talk about today. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Belmare. Hi, Adam. Welcome to Coding Over Cocktails. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, hello to you too, David. Hi, Adam. Thanks for joining us. Um, you, we're going to jump into your book and uh, talks obviously at Confluent being a, a, an organization orientated around Kafka. You've written a book uh, leveraging some of your expertise there about event-driven architectures and specifically event-driven architectures, how they relate to microservices. So we want to talk about that in some more detail, but maybe we can start off very, very simply by defining what an event is in this context. So can you tell us what an event is and, and uh, what it looks like? Right. Um, so an event is, I mean, quite simply, it's really anything of consequence to the business, which is, of course, a very uh, broad uh, definition, um, but it's because it does encompass the events do encompass a lot of areas. There, there's quite a, quite a few things uh, that can uh, that can encompass it. Now, the important part there is that it has to have some sort of underlining business meaning, and this is in large part because the 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 way to do event-driven services, microservices, or event-driven architecture as well, is to express things that are going on in your business and provide the opportunity for other parts of your business, other systems, other domains, other teams to react to it accordingly. And now, if we want to drill a little bit deeper into the structure of an event, um, I mean, to get some of the basic housekeeping out of the way, uh, typically you have a key and a value and some metadata about the event. Now, you don't have to have a key, but a key is very useful for um, for a variety of reasons, such as uh, if you're using a partitioned event stream to co-locate data. And usually your your key would be something like the, like the primary key of a database row. Mm -hmm. And a lot of events can kind of fall down into sort of two major categories, um, what I call state events. So again, if we use the relational database as an example, if you log into a database and you say, you know, select star where ID equals, I don't know, Adam Bellmer's ID, you'll get my row and you'll see all the current information. So a state event would, do, would be the same. It would reflect all of that information and that would be published to a stream. Now. A lot of, uh, and I, I think this is an important differentiation to make because a lot of materials, books, blogs, speakers, examples I, I see uh, will also use what's known as an action event or, or a verb event. And this is usually a descriptor that, that says something has changed. So if we use Adam, myself again, let's say I, I move house and I move from, so right now I live in Canada. Let's say I moved house to the United Kingdom. The event would show me moving from Canada to the UK, but it wouldn't have anything else in there about me. And so there's different kinds of events in how you structure it that way. And some of them are better for certain purposes and others are best suited for other purposes. Okay. All right. Now we're talking about event-driven architectures 
uh, in microservices settings. So how do the two relate? Right. So part of the, okay, so I'm trying to figure out how do I, how do I uh, frame this without getting too far down the rabbit hole? So how does this relate? How do these two relate? So I would say one of the, one of the big things um, about event-driven architectures today is that we have an opportunity to do things a bit differently than we used to do it. And this has been influenced largely because of cloud computing. Very cheap compute, very, very cheap disk, very cheap networking IO. And we have a, a new opportunity to actually communicate very large amounts of data very quickly between services. And this is something that we weren't really necessarily able to do before. So for example, in a event-driven service that you may have built 20 years ago, let's say, um, you would probably use some sort of action event. So let's say Adam moved, I moved house. Uh, you would send me, welcome to the United Kingdom, here's some information you need, sort of package. But that would trigger very specifically on that sort of edge. And so you would publish an event that's very purpose-built and, um, and almost somewhat intentional. And you would have a listener, a consumer on the other end that would receive it and do something with it. And then generally that stream would only be retained for maybe a few hours or a day, gets deleted and cleaned up. Now with modern event-driven um, brokers, event brokers, I should say, event stream brokers, uh, you can instead do it a bit differently. You could publish my fact and say, this is Adam. This is all the information we have about him. And then when I move, you can publish a whole updated one. And you say, anyone who cares about anything about users can listen to this stream and come up with your own logic. You can, main, disk is cheap, so you can maintain your own state. If you care about where's Adam's moving, you could, you could keep country, store that in your, in your service. And then whenever you see countries change, you can do whatever you want with it. But the big difference there is that the system that writes the data that produces it is producing what I would call a general purpose event and then leaves it up to the consumers to do whatever they will with it. And that's a big change uh, in terms of boundaries and in terms of responsibilities uh, that wasn't really available to us based on the technologies we had of, say, 20 years ago. Okay. And uh, th there's something you uh, talked about in your book with uh, reference to Conway's law, which we've talked about a few times in uh, our podcast before, where Conway's law uh, reflects the, the architecture of an application ends up reflecting organizational structure and process. Uh, does this also uh, tend to apply, do you find, when people are building event-driven microservices? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so one of the things that I really like about the way Conway's law is phrased, uh, and I'm, I'm also sort of paraphrasing from memory here, so I'm, I'm, I don't have it up in front of me, uh, but it discusses how the communication structure of the company, of the organization, of the team influences the design. So it's not just um, the team structure, and it's not just uh, how the teams are divided up. But if you think about, and, and I like to sort of deconstruct this, if you think about a, a business, if you think about a business, let's just, let's just cut to the chase. You think about a business that has like a monolith, one big monolith. And what they've done is they've taken what the business does well, the, the sort of means of communication they have between different teams, and they've written it in code. And that code also has a bunch of data associated with it. And so that whole framework there is its own communication structure. And that framework itself has a, a certain amount of data gravity. So it, it, um, it sort of makes it like, if you want to do something new, well, you're going to need to go where all your data is and all your data is pulled into here because all of your logic's related to it. And so you sort of have this technical structure your, you know, you could call it your code, your legacy code. No, sorry, I don't mean to say legacy. Uh, but basically, you have like this pre-existing hardened structure that really influences all of the other things you can do. 
And so one of the things with event-driven microservices is while we follow Conway's law at the team level, and you would say, you know, one service will be owned by one team. And, you know, the two pizza rule is obviously a great one. You don't have, uh, you know, ridiculous boundaries. You don't have uh, way too many people on there. But we're also looking at changing the relationship of the users building services to where they get their data from. And so we're renegotiating that communication structure in Conway's law and figuring out how do we make that work for us instead of sort of working against it. So you're saying that's a prerequisite to implementing event-driven microservices is thinking about your organizational structure and breaking it down into these two pizza teams? Um, I think it's, a, it's about being aware of it. Um, and I, it's, it's mostly be aware of the, of, the, of the, be aware of where you are and how that affects where you can go next, not where you can go in a long time from now, you know, let it's always hard enough to plan ahead that, that far ahead. But like, for example, if you have, um, if you have a, a desire to break out of a more monolithic approach, um, I mean, there's all, there's, I'm sure you've had speakers. I know you've had speakers on here before talk about this. So I'll spare you like the heavy detail or the details a bit too much, but like, basically you're trying to find, you know, what is some low hanging fruit? What, what are the things you can modularize? What are some of the things you can work on and learn from and, and, and win on? But a lot of these learnings come with what do you do with the data? Because if you have a monolith and there's nothing wrong with monoliths, monoliths are great. But if you have one that's getting too big and you need to split it up, where do you, you don't usually have a really neat seam because you'll often have a thing where like this module clearly writes this data, but then there's four or five other modules in there that need to access it. So if you pull that out, the writer out, well, what about the readers? Where do they get their data from? And so you sort of end up with this almost like a, you have like a loose thread on a shirt and you start pulling it. And then before you know it, the whole shirt's gone. Um, you, you sort of have this problem with what do you do with your data and how do you make this data easy to get access to? And that's really, I think, the crux of doing event-driven microservice as well. Well, it's interesting because well, I wanted to ask you about that a, a little bit later, like system migration and how it relates to microservices. So let's, let's just dive into that whilst we're talking about it now. So what approach are you saying that people should take um, uh, you mentioned this term data liberation uh, in your book. Uh, so what does it mean to liberate data in, in a legacy system migration and, and what approach should people be taking? Right. So I think a bit of uh, just, just for all of our, all of our listeners here, um, a, a lot of my experience is with Apache Kafka and uh, Kafka Connect. Um, quite explicitly. So I know there are other options out there, but I'm going to be speaking primarily about these just because this is, you know, what I've used for years and years. Um, but I think one of the important things is that there's, there's sort of like the high minded ideals. And it's like, you should have these well formed streams, and they should be clean and available, and everything will be great and rosy. But then there's also reality where, you know, you have maybe like, four weeks or six weeks to do something useful. And, you know, we're prototyping a microservice. Do we even want to invest in this? And so data liberation is basically getting data out of an existing system, an existing operational system, quite usually, into event streams so that you can try to build a microservice. So it's, it's, it's sort of like the event driven equivalent, I guess. I don't want to say it's entirely like the strangler fig pattern, but it's similar. What you're doing is you're tapping into the data, making that available, and then you can build some services off of it. Now, will it, um, will it be exactly what you want? Maybe, maybe not, but what it'll do is it'll get your It'll get you into it and it'll get you into it pretty quickly. And so I mentioned Kafka Connect because 
I mean, out of the box, you can set it up if you're using, uh, most people are using the cloud nowadays. So, I mean, requisition some machines. You may even, you may even be able to just, uh, I know that they have marketplaces sometimes and you can just, you know, someone will have one available and you can download it and run it, et cetera. Uh, but you can get started pretty quick on it. You can set up some connectors. So let's say uh, you're with a MySQL database. You can set up some connectors. Uh, you can get Debezium. I'm really quite fond of Debezium. Um, I'm fond of it because you can tail the binary log such that when a change is made to your database, you get that event in your stream seconds later, or you can even tighten it up a bit more if you really want. So you start getting a taste of this near real-time availability of data. And you can say, you know what, let's see if these microservices, these event-driven ones actually help us. Yeah. And you haven't had to do, and you haven't had to spend two years building a platform to do it first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the holy grail doesn't you know, exactly. start. We've got to work towards it. So let's talk about the architecture of implementing uh, microservices. In particular, the distinction between asynchronous and synchronous microservices. Can you give us a rundown of the difference between the two and why you're advocating asynchronous? event-driven microservices. Right. So uh, I'm going to work backwards uh, in that. Um, so why am I advocating asynchronous over synchronous? Uh, a couple of reasons. So first off, I need to express that both of these have their pros and cons, and there are trade-offs. And I think you should also um, mention what is an asynchronous versus synchronous, just for those that right. aren't familiar with the two. Okay. Yeah, let's disambiguate that right now. So in my... Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of hard when you put pen to paper how to describe it properly. So synchronous is what I also call a request response. So a service makes a request and then awaits a response to do to move on with its work. Now, there's a bit of a caveat there because there's also ways where you can do non-blocking requests and your server isn't technically waiting but your client's waiting for the other server to make a response to them and then pass it back. So, you know, there's also some asynchronous communication elements in there. And I'm sort of trying to gloss those over because the idea is really, I ask a server to do something on my behalf. And then eventually it comes back to me and says, here's your information. That's a, that's a synchronous request response. An asynchronous one um, in this an asynchronous event of a microservice, we're communicating through an event stream. So you can, you know, again, you could still do a pattern where you send an event to a, a service and then it sends you a, a reply back over streams. You can still do that. Um, but you can also do unidirectional where you're publishing important business facts and that service that's publishing it, I'm not gonna say it doesn't care what it's downstream people are doing, but it's trusting them that they'll use that data for some intelligent, fair purpose. And that's it. Like the, the service doesn't actually care about what's going on there. So with those two sorts of services, you have different sorts of patterns. So synchronous ones, um, I think it's worth noting that there's a lot of companies that have used them very well. And service mesh is a, is a pattern, uh, sorry, is an architectural pattern uh, paradigm that works well. Lots of companies have done it. But I mean, some of the downsides there can be um, so uh, the operational concerns, such as what happens if you have a very sudden load? You know, can you scale up in, in response or do people start timing out? Uh, if you can have sort of fan out or calls that may be chained too deeply. So server A calls B, that calls C, that calls D, that calls E, and then E fails. And so you can sort of get these complex distributed couplings synchronously uh, through your services. And just to be clear, service mesh is an alternative implementation for microservices versus this event-driven architecture. Uh, that's why you mentioned the service mesh approach. It takes the synchronous approach, but you're advocating the asynchronous approach. So, so tell us why. Yes. So the just the the reason I'm advocating the asynchronous approach is that one of the things that the synchronous one does is the synchronous one effectively says, we'll give you business centric functions for you to call and we'll do work on your behalf. 
the one I'm advocating is asynchronous in the sense that we'll give you the read only data you need to make your decisions for your business purposes. So it's, it's instead of providing you with functions to call, it's providing you with streams of readily usable data to make your own decisions on. So they're very different in that regard. Um, but, uh, but I think that would probably be like the most distinct difference. Is there a scenario where you would use both? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would actually be honestly surprised if, if someone said we're only going to use one, I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I mean, one of the examples, like if I'm going to do a centri- sorry, centralized uh, authentication of a user, I'm probably just going to use a synchronous service. Like it's bread and butter for that. You know, there's some use cases that are just r- really phenomenally straightforward. Um, so yeah, I would say, yeah, you're going to use both. Okay, so they all have, they both have their uh, advantages and disadvantages and can work together. It, let's talk about um, uh, the contract and if contract exists in this space. So in the world of APIs, we often talk about a contract that governs how the data is exchanged between the publisher and consumer. Now, you've talked about this decoupling of publishing messages to an event stream and it doesn't really care what those consumers, who those consumers are, and what they're going to do with the data. So in an event-driven architecture, is there still the concept of a contract between the parties? Right, yeah. So there is. There is still the concept. Um, so basically, the way, it, the way it works is that there's, let's see, if, if in a synchronous service world, you would have a, an API spec and these are functions you can call parameters to pass in expected values and some documentation now in an event driven uh world where your where your where your consumers are coupling on event streams the the event streams themselves are the api and so what that means is um they really 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 it's it's an essential necessity they have to have a strong well-defined schema And I'm fairly partial to Apache Avro, uh, but I've been using Protobuf a bunch lately. And honestly, they're both fantastic. The reason why they're important is that they enforce types. They enforce whether a field is mandatory or not. They enforce whether something can be nullable or not. And they also provide uh, the ability to add documentation, add comments, and add, and again, depending on which particular format you're using, there's some other nuances on what you can and can't do. But what that gives is the consumer gets this ability to say, okay, I want to read from this event stream. I need to, what does the schema look like? Show me the schema. And they can see the schema. And not only can you see it, but in a well-supported microservice world, uh, Ideally, you can push a button that'll generate uh, code off that schema. So you can get, like if you're using Java, you get your class file definitions. Um, You can generate test code. You can basically build, automate sort of that coupling between what the event streams have and, and how that would integrate in with your microservice. So in that regard, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same as a, uh, synchronous API where you have a contract between parties because the the consumer has built services relying on that schema, and so if you break the API or if you break the schema in a event driven architecture, you're going to break those consumers. So whilst you don't care about those consumers really, you re- very much do in terms of you do have a contract with them in terms of the way they're going to consume data. Is there a mechanism to change that contract to? To, to break the contract to, to version your uh, your schema yeah so that that's true so the the other part of your component is the social or of the contract is of course the social contract right um, now so the what okay I'm going to I'm going to add a bit more to this one of the more recent technology uh, sorry technical paradigms is data mesh and one of the things that's great about data mesh, and I won't go too deep into it, but it, it, 
it is this, like it talks about how data needs to be well supported, how there needs to be a means of communication between the users of the data and those who own it. Uh, there needs to be well-defined schemas, clear metadata, clear expectations, and, and also processes for if you're going to break something. So, I mean, that's about as much as I'll say about it, but what I really like about it is that it talks about and codifies and you know, looks at these, this precise problem here. And so the, the sort of, how would you do this in reality if you're going to break, if you need to break your schema? Well, you got to find your consumers and uh, a bit of a sort of quick tip for that would be uh, if you're doing a microservice world from day one, uh, you need to have well-defined service identities and if any service wants to couple on an event stream, it needs to have access control granted, kept in a list. So then you can go, oh, who's consuming from this stream? It's these eight services. Let's go find the owners. We're going to email them or you know whatever you do, get them in a room and say, listen, we have to break the schema and you're going to be impacted. So let's figure this out. Um, so I'm glad, you, I'm glad you raised that because I wanted to talk about some of the uh, the patterns and workflows you've talked about in your book uh, for building these microservices. You talk about the choreography pattern, orchestration, and distributed transactions. Uh, you know, these are all big subjects in their own right. But can you briefly uh, run us through what these patterns are? Right. So uh, orchestration is what I would call the simplest it's the the least restrictive so we already sort of talked about that when i when i said you know there's a service that might publish important business facts it holds up its end of the contract but it generally leaves it up to the customers to figure out what they want to use it for uh, this is uh, a good example of this could be a uh, just because everyone always uses e-commerce i'll just keep using that um, if you're publishing inventory you're ever updating inventory uh this could feed a search fun search engine functionality, you know, show me items that are in stock. It could feed the service that actually monitors our inventory. You know, what do we have available? Maybe it makes predictions based on how quickly inventory is depleting, right? And you could have a third service uh, that actually maps it to where it may be in the warehouse. But none of them need to tell the producer, you know, this is what I'm doing. The producer is like, you know, good on you. And that's choreography. So each service is sort of acting independently, but they do have dependencies coupled through, through the reliance on the data. Orchestration is, uh, well, if you're familiar with any forms of distributed computing, an orchestrator usually indicates some sort of centralized component that needs to make sure other various components sort of stay in a consistent state. And that's exactly the same as it is here. So a, uh, for example, if you have a, um, let's say you want to do payments. So someone wants to order something, we reserve the inventory, and then we take their payment, but in that order. So if we take their order, but we don't have the inventory, then we got to roll back and re-reject the order. And similarly, if you go down to payments. So the orchestrator is very purpose-built for a specific business process. And its goal is to, or sorry, its role, its responsibility is to issue commands to specific services that it's fairly tightly coupled to and then await responses. And so the orchestrator needs to keep state about where it is in that process. It needs to be durable. It needs to be able to handle at least one's processing. If the whole thing crashes to the ground, you need to be able to bring it back and resume you know, both rolling back certain ones and, and moving other ones forward. So uh, that's orchestration. And, and sorry, what was the last one we were? Distributed transactions is the other. Okay, yes. Yeah, so yeah, distributed transactions. I think anytime anyone ever talks about them, the first thing they say is avoid them. Um, it's sort of, you know, try to avoid them if possible. Um, but yeah, orchestration, the orchestrator pattern is is a fairly good way to do them if you're going to do them. Now, uh, I think the caveat here is that it depends, part of it depends, I guess, on how fast you need to go. 
because if you're going to be doing uh, event driven for your commands and your and your um, responses, and perhaps one service is lagging, is slow, or whatnot, uh, it can have sort of a knock on effect into how these distributed transactions are working. So it's one of those things where if you're going to do it, you would probably need to figure out if it's in the, like a critical path or if you can tolerate some delay. If it is in a critical path and it's customer facing and it needs to be distributed, uh, you know, I would sort of want to know, like, is there a way we can simplify it? Is there a way maybe that we can merge some services together that we can bring some locality back towards it to sort of simplify and reduce it? Uh, because honestly, the more moving parts you have, the more things can go wrong. So simplify, simplify, simplify would be my advice. Okay, good advice. Uh, we, we briefly touched on this earlier when you mentioned um, that you, you you do have a Kafka background and, and, and orientation at Confluent. But is all of this around Kafka? Are there other uh, solutions for building event-driven microservices. For example, we recently had a podcast, which was a Kafka versus JMS Smackdown, which in the end, there was a lot of agreement that actually it wasn't uh, necessarily uh, either or. It, uh, they both had their own uh, use cases and uh, both were in agreement. Is it the same case here? Is this only about Kafka? Are there other bro message brokers which also apply in this scenario? And if so, how do you know when to choose between the two? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, there are there are other other broker options, and uh, this isn't something that's explicitly a Kafka thing. Uh, I know there's a, a number of uh, a number of alternatives available that you can do. I think the I think the big for selecting, I think it comes down to a couple of things. One, do you need durability? So what that means is like, if I write to this event stream, um, how long can I keep that message or that event in there? Can I keep it indefinitely? Because if I can keep it indefinitely, then I can use that event stream as the source of my data. And I can use say like a Kappa architecture to process historical data whenever I want. So that will limit some of your choices. Um, for example, uh, AWS Kinesis at the moment, uh, I think has a one year maximum retention. It used to be, I think two weeks. Now it's one year, but they don't care how much data you store. So the retention limit there isn't, I don't think it's a technical reason. I don't, you know, I don't want to guess too much in there, but that would prevent you from say, if I, if I registered now and in two years from now, would me registering still be in that event stream? The answer is no, it would have aged out. Um, if you need queues, if you need queue-based functionality or individual acknowledgement, uh, I mean, with Kafka, we do have some options that you can do that, but other brokers might be better suited, uh, especially if you just want work queues, for example. Like you may want to go with uh, like a very queue-specific queue one. Um, and if you're looking to do more event-driven uh, communication where you don't really want to communicate sort of state, but you'd rather just communicate uh, action events and say, you know, this changed and then I want like a simple Lambda function to react to this because that's the scale of where your business is right now. Um, there's lots of simpler options where you're just going to be running, you know, sort of like a minimalist uh, message router that's entirely, um, entirely uh, ephemeral or volatile. And so you do have lots of these different kinds of options, but it, it, it kind of depends on what it is that you need, because what I'm advocating is much more about providing data as building blocks, like this data as building blocks, so you can build any kinds of services you need um, through time. Well, the book is called Building Event Driven Microservices, Leveraging Organizational Data at Scale. Adam, how can our listeners uh, learn more about you, uh, your book? Where can they follow you on social media? Oh, yes. Uh, so my book is through O'Reilly. And uh, I, 
I honestly really like their learning platform. Uh, it's very good. <laughs> I'm quite biased, I guess, but, uh, but I, I go on it all the time. I, I, I read, honestly, that's a great place to start. I believe they have, you know, they're not paying me to say this, but I believe they actually have a one month free subscription or two weeks or something. So, I mean, that would be, if you haven't already done it, that'd be your easiest way uh, to get, to get on there and see what else they have available. Uh, Cause there's lots of really great material. Uh, of course, you can buy the book in paper if you're more like me and you like the the physical tactile turning of the pages. Um, I know it's on Amazon at the very least. Uh, honestly, I'm not entirely really sure. I haven't purchased my own book, so I'm not entirely <laughs> sure where it's all for sale. After the show, Google yourself. Are you, are you, are <laughs> yeah. you, are you active on social media? Or is, is, uh, I'm, on, on, I'm on Twitter. I Yeah, um, just Adam, Adam Bellmare on Twitter. Uh, I think I'm the only one. Uh, I, t- I try to tweet. I'm a fairly recent. Uh, I think I signed up in 2020, so I'm pretty late to the game. Uh, but you know, I found some some good technical people that I like to follow. So it's uh, it's kind of nice. You can curate your feed just to see the things you want, and you know, keep the blood pressure low. So great stuff, Adam. <laughs> thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Hey listeners, thank you for joining us in this round of cocktails. Please like and subscribe to check out other episodes of this podcast series. We're also available on your favorite podcast platforms, or you can simply listen in at torocloud.com where you'll find full episode transcripts and show notes. On behalf of the team here at Toro Cloud, thank you very much for listening to us today. This has been Kevin Montalbo for Coding Over Cocktails. Cheers! Cheers!